Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Nicole Gruel. And what country are you in? Australia. Australia. Okay. And you're like me, you drowned as a child. I sure did. Yeah. You want to tell us about it? Uh, yeah, for sure. So um, I was 14 years old and I was over in New Zealand and we went whitewater rafting um, and it was an amazing experience. If anyone listening has ever been whitewater rafting, you'll know it's just completely exhilarating. And we went down this massive uh, waterfall as one of the bits on the run. Um, I think in US terms, it's 32 feet. So it was a, it was a 10 meter drop. And and the boat tipped over um, when we got to the bottom. The boat bounced feet. on its nose and then oh. tipped. Yeah, big, big. I mean, Yay. that's the, the main feature of this river. That's why people do it. And um, and so anyway, the boat tipped and um, I went out of the boat and I had a natural response as a swimmer, which was to throw my arms out to try and swim. And that's exactly what you're not supposed to do when you have, you know, 32 feet of water pounding down um, on top of you. And so what that actually did was it pushed me down very, very deep into the water where it was just completely black. And in that blackness, I didn't know which way was up or down. And so I knew that there was no point even trying to swim because I could be going in the wrong direction. And the next thought that occurred to me was, this is my last breath. And very soon after that thought was another thought which was, uh, well, it wasn't a thought actually, sorry. The last thought was, this is my last breath. And the next thing that happened was I got very calm. I got very calm. Everything you didn't have a lot very, of pain and struggle? Painful. None. I, it was just an acknowledgement that this is my last breath. Oh, mine was so painful. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. No, this was, this. I mean, it was a blessing in that sense. This was as, as easy as they come. This was an easy NDE. <laughs> And um, I saw in the blackness of the water, I saw a horizon of light opening up. And in that horizon of light uh, coming towards me was my then living grandmother and my then deceased first dog, um, who was, you know, my, my pets were like my siblings because I grew up an only child. So I was very, very close with, with the fur friends. And um, so these two were coming towards me in that light. And I was only 14, you know, so my thinking wasn't too robust on these things. And I simply thought, this is unusual. What are you doing here? And then I heard a male voice right here next to my head, super, super clear. I still don't know who or what it was to this day, but very clear male voice say to me, Nicole, remember to breathe. And something about that clicked in my frontal memory here. And I remembered I had to curl up like, um, like a little ball because, I, of course, I had the life jacket on. And so the memory was that I, the recollection, you have to curl up like a ball. And so I did. And I just came up. I just popped up like a cork up to the surface. So it went from like dark green water to light green to, to whitewash. And when I came up, I took breath. So I hadn't swallowed down water. I hadn't passed out anything like that. I took breath. And um, they were fortunate to get me where I was because I was about to enter the mouth of a cave. And as you can imagine, at the bottom of a waterfall that size, the water is like very rough and all over the place. So people are moving quick um, to come and get me. And so they saw me pop up. They immediately went to get me. I, I joke that I was lucky I had my near death and not my death experience that day because had they not picked me up at that moment I, I into the cave, I would have gone. And, um, and again, I was 14, so I got plucked into the boat. I was just glad I didn't die that day. And for years, I never thought anything of it because it wasn't, and you'll know this as a child NDE, yeah, Peggy, I'm sure it might be similar for you. And, and PMH Water talks about this, that, you know, as kids, we just, we haven't got our ideas and concepts of the world formed in terms of how they ought to be. And so when something as monumental as that happens, we just accept it as part of what is. And so there's no great paradigm shift that, that, at least in my case, there was no great paradigm shift that needed to happen. It was just part of my experience and on I carried with life. And it wasn't until later on in life that I started meeting others and hearing about experiences and understanding my own experiences more that I could start to look back and go, oh, that was a thing. It has a name. 
and that was maybe significant in some way oh that was way down the path later yeah. on yeah so so that was the first big one you didn't yeah. have pain i feel like cheated <laughs> gosh it hurt like i mean i can just remember that pain in my throat so bad and then the point i thought i can't stand it anymore like it was gonna burst and but you were just wow and so what, what do you make of your grandmother that wasn't dead that was there yeah well you know that was a curious feature and as i started understanding there's this community of people who talk about near-death experiences and i met other people who were talking about this thing that was a question i started asking because i realized everyone's talking about you meet you, you can often meet your dead relatives or you know see beings of light and no one was talking about you meet living people so i started asking questions eventually i'm like hey so what do you make of this what do you make of this and no one really had any answers for me. I think in my time of sharing, I've met two other people who had a living person come to them. And one person who, you know, who was well knowledgeable about these experiences, she asked me, she said, well, what significance does your grandmother have in your life, you know? And so I journeyed with that question for a bit. And she was a highly significant character in my life. You know, I, my language, my Japanese language wasn't very good, so I couldn't communicate with her well. But from when I was a kid, we went over to Japan once a year. I'd spend time, you know, the Christmas, New Year season, which is the biggest time of year there for family. So we'd spend that time and culturally, you know, we I, I had a connection there to her. Um, I didn't learn about much of her story she has you know an amazing story as well as a very strong woman later on and then what i also came to know was that her lineage is that of samurai and so there is a samurai line in the family that comes down and i can see how that strong samurai spirit through the women has come down um, in in that side of the family so for me she has been a support a spirit support um, she's been an ancestral support to help me understand my roots and who I am and give me strength. And really importantly, when she actually did transition from the physical um, in, in, in this lifetime, I, I got to be there. I got to be there in the weeks leading up to her passing. I wasn't there at the moment of death. And then afterwards, when the way that the Japanese work with the body afterwards is they keep the body for a while and, you know, they treat it and do what's needed to keep the body. But you keep your loved ones in your home for a little bit, you know, so that you can start to grieve in a really um, soft way, you know, much softer than I I was familiar with in, in the Western world where, you know, someone dies and then they vanish and then you see them once at like funeral or awake and, you know, and then it's gone and it's done. Um, really, really different. I mean, you know, when I was in Japan and my grandmother was there, her body was in this room. My mum and I shared the room next door. And so we slept and we dreamt there while my ancestors the in japan all houses have this kind of little shrine for the ancestors so all the ancestors were there and then my grandma over there and i was really weirded out by this peggy at first i was like whoa this is strange stuff but i understood and as i watched my own journey of grieving that loss and that ability to really grieve in a healthy way over several weeks and then into several months actually helped me release a whole heap of pent up unprocessed grief that I had about other losses earlier in my life. So it was the greatest blessing. And I really call my, I consider my grandma one of my greatest teachers in terms of the transition. Um, death is not the greatest word for it. I think transition fits a bit better. I, I don't know a better way to language that, but such a powerful figure in showing me uh, shifting through the gateways, I guess. Yeah. I've had a couple guests that actually did see live people in their NDE, but those people died shortly after their NDE. So you don't know how much mm. was for your grandma. She was a, no, okay. she was healthy and well, and she carried on for, I think it was almost a good decade afterwards. It was several years anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the other, on the other side, there's shifts of time. Like we can go back in their past, like life review, or sometimes we go into the future and see things. 
And so I just think, you know, in that realm, anything's possible. And, you know, for whatever reason, maybe just brought some comfort to you. Maybe where you didn't panic or who was it that said, took, take a breath, take a breath. Was it just a voice? I, I don't know. It was a male voice that was right here. It felt so close. Um, and, and I don't know who it was. Yeah. Well, you told me that. People I'm thinking, had lots take of a guesses. breath. She's underwater. Why oh, she going to take a breath? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, it said, Nicole, remember to breathe. Remember breathe. to breathe. And so that something about that triggered the recollection of how I'm supposed to breathe, which is, oh, curl up and then I'll, I'll pop up again. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, when my um, little boy, when Jeremy was a little boy, my son, and um, my older son yelled, Mom, Jeremy. And, you know, I I was just like frozen in fear. And I started praying and my husband took off running to see what was wrong. And I started praying. Then I was like out in the air. And then suddenly, because like out in that other realm is all knowledge. And I didn't plan this. Okay, I'm going to go in the other realm. You know, I mean, it's just like I was 25. I mean, I know what's going on. All I know is just start praying. Then all of a sudden, I was in the like, like out in this above the field. I couldn't see anything, but it was a knowing. I suddenly knew what was wrong with Jeremy. Because um, this creek, I would never guess that he was drowning because it was always ankle deep. We just bought the property. But we, and this knowing came, but we've had a lot of rain and melting snow and it's creeks up and it's swift. And he fell in and he's trying to swim where he could, if he would calm down, he could just stand up and walk out of there. So I just got that knowing. So I started praying, Jeremy, stand up. It's not that deep. Calm down, walk out of there. And he was like four or five. And he was like 20 at a, a New Year's Eve party he was having. I told that story for the very first time to his cousin, his friend. And Jeremy overheard me. He came out and said, mom, I heard you praying. So, you know, I was a live person, but somehow I was communicating and I didn't know he heard me. I just know, I just knew I was so scared. And when he come out of that creek, he went right past his dad who had just got there and didn't look at him because I was, you know, like away because I slowly, after I prayed, I slowly walked down because I, I refused to see my child dead. God, you don't give us more than what we can do. I can't do this. And I seen Jeremy and I thought, my first thought was, is this a ghost? Do I imagine things? Because I just was so afraid my baby was dead. And he never took him big blue eyes off me. He walked over. He stood right in front of me. He looked at me and said, Mom, was you worried about me? And I did not know for all those years that he heard me praying, Jeremy, stand up, come down. It's not that deep. All kind of, you know. And I think that's the moment when I knew all these memories I had, there's something to this. This is because I've always thought, what's these weird memories? They don't make sense. And I thought, I have a witness. Then it just like, I got to start taking this stuff serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and it's pretty magical when we do, right? Yeah. Start taking yeah, it seriously. Yeah, it changes our view of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I had. Uh, yeah. Well, Bill, I mean, that's. Yeah. I had Bill uh, Guggenheim on earlier. He was talking about after death communication. And I got thinking. All that fits lines right up with. I don't know what your gifts, spiritual experience are since you're in D.E., but um, when I get voices, like I can't say it's grandma, it's grandpa, I don't get that, you know, but um, just these voices and tell me things and lead me in this direction, but it matched perfectly what he's saying about near-death communication, even though they're not, you know, loved ones. So, I mean, I've had those too, but, you know, but, you know, where, you know, this someone that has passed and you get this little communication, but <clears throat> I just thought that was odd how this realm fits such a line as a sequence of information of it's almost like a language mm. that there's so yeah, many well that, tools to it really. Yes. Yes. And that, that resonates with me completely about this, you know, telepathic, communication um, like I said I don't know who that voice was but as you share there you know you were praying for your son because you felt it and he heard it and I that would be very believable to me in terms of my own experience of you know someone who cared for me who understood what was going on in that moment and, and said something yeah could I don't know I don't know it's it's amazing all of it yeah, and <laughs> all of, you... it, of when, what is possible and I think once you hear a voice from the other side, it like, <clears throat> now you have that mind. 
you know, like I don't have internet in my house until I hook up the internet. And now I have that line. And it's, I think it's kind of like that. Once we've had a, whether through an NDE or uh, after death communication, whatever, when you hear that voice, it's just, it seems to me like there's this some kind of line open now that it's going to continue to happen. And we never know when, because I don't control it. I don't know about anybody else, you know, I suppose it wants to go to mediums or psychics, you know, and they ask for something, but you know, I'm not ever controlled when I hear, other than one time, I went to the bathroom, <laughs> looked in the mirror, and I told God, because I just got through a 16-year marriage divorce, and I said, God, apparently I can't pick them. I want you to arrange my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and I was serious, because months before this, I was sobbing in there about the divorce alone, nobody else in the house, and I suddenly, I heard from over to the side, I heard my child in front of like over by the mirror in the bathroom. And so I went back to that and I said, you said, I'm, you know, I'm your child. So you're my father and I want you to arrange my marriage. And he, and I was told, follow God, like a leaf follows the wind. My, all my job was to trust. And I went out that night and I met my husband. We've been married now 25 years. So. And, and then the synchronicities, wow. I guess the word is, the, to look back, like, wait a minute, after we were dating a few months, this is a guy I had a crush on high school. And I've always told me then I had to go become a better person. This is, he said, look at him. This is what goodness looks like. I'm not to approach. He said, you know, those voices have been there off and on, but it was just stuff I pushed away. I don't understand that. Kind of like when you're 14 and drown, what are you going to do with that? You're not going to tell everybody, hey, I just saw grandma when I was drowning. You know, we, we just, we just don't. And I, I'm, I'm very impressed with the people that do that wake up from surgery and say, I just saw God or, you know, whatever that just like um, heaven's for real. Um, the boy just started telling his family, you know, most of us kids, we don't do that. We just keep it in. Yeah. And I mean, just because it, it happened. So it was it was unusual. I was glad to be alive that day. I didn't particularly d deny it or bury it or suppress it or keep it to myself intentionally. It's just that it wasn't anything overly remarkable um, for me, you know, and um, and as I carried on in my life and I had other spiritual experiences, all of that added to the richness of, um, you know, having just having openness to the beyond the ordinary um so again it really wasn't until much later on that i i encountered the near-death experience community and people kept talking about these near-death experiences and i was like oh i've had one of those you know and trying to understand how that particular event at that point in my life has been important in a in a whole constellation of many experiences that have happened um yeah yeah would you so want to nice be able to look back your spiritual experiences? Well, we'd be here all day, Peggy. <laughs> we'd be here all I'm day. I'm not going day. anywhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's, there's, I, I talk about three three big bangs, you know, and okay. I think these are three major ones that have happened. They're like three big bangs amongst a constellation of stars. Um, and all of those stars being like a whole heap of, you know, having a visionary experience here or having like this open dance awareness there or, you know, lots of little pieces along the way that are still remarkable spiritual experiences. But there were three big bangs that um, truly, you know, when I line those ones up together, I'm like, oh, I can see a bit of a, a story going on there. So the first is the one that I'd shared with you. And the second happened when I was... Um, about about 30 years old turning 30 years old somewhere around there and it happened over three days and i went in and out of spontaneous states of ordinary and non-ordinary consciousness and it was a process that i felt i didn't have any control over it was very much like um you know taking some kind of psychedelic substance where it happens the journey happens i hadn't had any kind of substance at all um, what had what was happening on the physical level was I had um, my monthly cycle, my woman's cycle. And each month when I would get that, I would experience really, um, I've been told it's the closest thing before fainting. So all of the sounds are amplified, everything, like all of the light just gets very sharp and I need to be in a cave, essentially. I just need to be, you know, tucked away. And, um, but I wouldn't faint, you know, so I'd just go through that, that very uncomfortable state was for like a whole day. Was it stress or pain was... or? Um, 
I it was just my regular thing that I was used to with the first oh. day of my woman's you cycle. just got like yeah, and you I, were faint. Yeah, but I've never fainted. So I don't actually know what it is to faint, but I've been told when I've described it that that's what it's like the moment before you faint. So kind of extend that out for a day and that's what I would experience. So, you know, usually on the first day of my cycle, I'd, I'd just be out of action completely. I'd, I'd have to stay at home and just be in bed all day and just go through this thing that my body was doing. Um, which was really unpleasant and you know great story I eventually met a wonderful naturopath who you know became a good friend of mine she healed me of all of that and and it was good and so for any woman going through that it is curable and it is treatable and you know our bodies are amazing but we've got to work with them and learn what's going on but anyway so it was one of those times and that's what the trigger was and so I just went into my regular state of okay I'm going to have to be on a couch for a day now and go through this what I didn't know that was that would become three days of flipping in and out of these states and that I would have these non-ordinary states come as well so to describe that it was um it, the first part was very shamanic it was like my my attention and my focus went down once through my right side my right foot and once down through my left foot and down each track and this is a shamanic technique i was meeting ancestors down each of those so down my father line down my mother line and i was meeting ancestors that came before and the pro process I later understood was that I was healing things in my DNA that I was carrying in the present that had not been healed in my storyline through my ancestors in the past. So anything where they had transitioned, but something was left unresolved, incomplete on earth time and physical lifetime that was in my system on some level of my DNA. So that needed to be healed. So that process happened. And then there was a clearing, which was quite Kundalini like in nature, it went up and through the system, but I call it the dark side of, of Kundalini, you know, that it was like wading through molasses. I was, it was so dark, Peggy, there was, you know, past traumas I had to um, go through and process and, and become more aware of there were um, things that I hadn't wanted to deal with or hadn't even thought about, you know, up until my time and even more, more minor things, which were not so minor, but things like heartbreak and relationships. And so basically any pain or wounding that had happened through my entire life, all of that was getting cleared as well, processed and cleared one by like one, life by, one by one. <clears throat> um, yeah, I guess in a way, I guess in a way, because this experience I later call, I later understood to be a near death like experience. Yeah, because I was not at death's door with my physical body, even though I was going through a physical process. Uh, a stressful physical process with fever and, and all the rest and couldn't move much but I was certainly not in harm's way um, in, in that sense like the classic NDE but it was near death like in that it had a lot of features yeah. you know so the review so that was all getting cleared and healed and um, that happened and then this really interesting process which I called the onion peel happened layers of my being myself my identity those were each layers of the onion they just started getting peeled off and again this was not within my control and I actually found it quite a terrifying process and it started speeding up and this is towards the end of the three days now and so one of those onion layers for example was you know my name is Nicole and then whoosh, it's like this greater force just whoosh that one off me okay girl I am girl on couch whooshed and there that one goes as well right so they just they kept whooshing kept getting ripped off until there was nothing left in that core except the teeniest tiniest pinprick of light that was it that was it there was nothing more than that there was nothing less than that that and so that was a huge knowing for me understanding in that moment that this is all I am and my life completely transformed after that point because I understood that anything beyond this pinprick of light is something that I co-create. It's a creative game that happens after that. My name, my identity, the relationships I have, the interactions I have, how I define myself, how I do things in the world, all of that is a co-creative game. I get to create it with the greater creative force that is. 
and none of it should be taken too seriously. I can be very light in how I walk that and I always have the power to change and shift that. So something about that experience really helped me walk the world in a much lighter, more joyful way where, of course, I still take things very seriously, um, but not to the degree where it debilitates me in any way, because I understand that we have the agency to change. We have the agency to change our life. We have the agency to change anything that we're unhappy with, um, but we have to actively do something within it. Yeah. So that was the second big bang. You have a PhD in psychiatry, psychology? Transpersonal psychology. Okay. Yes. So what like does this say about psychology. this? I mean, because... <laughs> You know, because we go to a shrink and they're going to be like, okay, medication, but you know better. So, but right. anything in your right. experience so that would explain? I mean, I only got another one to tell. Well, well but- exactly. That's why, so I'm not a clinical psychologist. I don't, you know, I, I don't diagnose. I don't use the diagnoses and I, I never will diagnose anyone because uh, I don't buy into that system. But I don't either. So transpersonal psychology is um, it's spiritual psychology and what it is is the the psychology that came it's the school of psychology that came after the ones that we now have that are dominating that kind of classify and label everything as you know a pathology transpersonal psychology came along to say no this is not pathological these experiences are part of our human potential and so we need to understand religions we need to understand wisdom paths we need to understand people's connection to something greater than themselves and nature Uh, we need to understand ourselves our bodies and all of its wisdom so it's a really it comes from many different angles, the, the, the school of transpersonal psychology, all with the goal of understanding who we can be at our best and at our kind of most expanded and what is that greater thing and our relationship to it. Because yeah. um, if it's a crazy, so I was, crazy the heels. <laughs> what, sorry, I missed if, that. If thing. it's all a crazy, it's a crazy that heals. And, you know, there's, there's that line that um, the madmen and the mystics swim in the same waters, you know, and that line between what is considered in, in modern conventional psychology and psychiatry as mad and then on the other side as some kind of the extreme, like a spiritual emergency, for example, it's, it's a really grey, fuzzy line. It's really, really fuzzy. And the thing about the the DSM, the little book that is used to diagnose people, is most people could sit down with that book and find a couple of labels for themselves. Most of us really could. And I mean, you can, you know, for those listening, you can look up the history of the DSM itself and how it came about and how all of those labels continue um, to be, you know, um, how the book grows and its own history. And there are a lot of question marks involved in that and the research and, you know, go, go, go look at, go look some stuff up, go do a bit of homework in that area and make your own mind up about it. Yeah. And does um, anybody as as go yeah. and not come back with a diagnosis or something? <laughs> you can diagnose you with something like to medicate you. Yes. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've never been diagnosed and had I in that experience that I just shared with you there where I was on the couch for three days, my mother was very concerned because I was essentially, you know, there, right. And in these fevers. And she said to me, Nicole, we need to get you to hospital. And because by that stage I was, you know, almost 30 or around 30. And I I knew something at that stage about spiritual processes. And so I said to her, something important is taking place. I don't know what it is, but something important is taking place. If I really need to go, I'll go. And bless my beautiful mother. She had the space holding capacity, even though she was freaked out. She had no idea what was going on. She had the space holding capacity to just let me be on that couch for my psychosomatic system to just play out what it needed to. Had I been taken to the hospital at that point in time, you're absolutely right. I probably would have gone down a different pathway. Um, And I I work with people now. I work with many people who have had a diagnosis, many people who have not had diagnoses, all of them who've had spiritual experiences. For the folks who have had a diagnosis, I find it varies. Most of them say, 
I, I wish it didn't happen. It wasn't very helpful. I even had to heal myself out of that path. But there are some that say that was the most wonderful thing and the best thing that could have happened to me at that time. I was either a, a risk of harming myself or harming um, somebody else. And I, I was not in my right mind at that time. I couldn't, you know, make sense of anything. And so I, I was kept safe in that container and it gave me language and structure and helped me understand what was going on with me. So, you know, my, my third Big Bang experience, Peggy, was the one that helped me release my judgments. <laughs> I'd like to think as much as possible, but it really helped me release my judgments about, you know, prior to that point, I'd had certain ideas about, you know, whether it was um, helpful or not helpful to go through, you know, whatever pathway. And the, the third experience, so I'll just outline it um, briefly, was when I was birthing my daughter, my first daughter. And um, after 90 hours of, you know, from when the waters broke to um, getting into a hospital, um, I was very tired. I was, you know, the apparently the baby was under stress. They couldn't find much of the heartbeat. So the hospital was getting concerned. So I agreed to an intervention, which is not what I wanted to do. I was very, you know, strong on I am going to birth this thing naturally, right? I'm going to do this thing. Right. But it wasn't to be for me. And um, so they gave me the happy gas. And I had, in a split second, I returned to that same horizon of light that was from my near-death experience as, as a really? teenager. Yeah, the exact same place. Only the difference is now this time I knew. I knew exactly where I was. I'd, I'd done my PhD in this stuff by this time. I was well in contact with folks in the near-death experience community and other spiritual experiences. I've been holding sacred circles with women. I mean, I had, you know, so-called spiritually savvy teacher folks just, you know, all around me. I was so supported in so many ways. And, and I'd been working with experiences as well. So I was very well versed now in understanding what was going on. So I returned to the horizon of light and I, I had a split consciousness. One part of me was fully aware of my physical body in the room with the midwives and the machines and all the chaos that was going on. And the other part was at this horizon of light where everything was actually really comical. This was like the divine humor, which is very twisted. I'm not sure if you've had this experience. I find cosmic humor to be incredibly twisted and paradoxical. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in the pain of all of it, I was laughing. That part of me was laughing my head off. My physical body wasn't laughing, but that part of me was laughing my head off at how ridiculous I had been and how perfect this whole situation was and how this was exactly the experience I needed to help me realize my own stubbornness in terms of natural birthing and how that ought to be right my dogmatic way of thinking and it also then helps soften me in terms of other people and their journeys you know I'm like we, we honestly we have no idea Idea what somebody else's path is and somebody else's story and for me to lay any kind of judgment upon that of how it ought to be for them or what the right path should be limits my capacity to be open with that person in any moment limits my capacity to walk with them um, so through their own expansion as well right so I understood all of that in that moment and um, so that was great to have kind of those 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 judgments just fly out the door. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I, I get that why people have all these medical interventions. And then I get why all of people have a lot of psychiatric interventions. And, you know, so I could I could broaden it out. And even though they might there might be harmful side effects that can come off it. Right. And no system is perfect. I could start to see how. OK, but but things can have their place as well. Right. Um, so that was really the third big bang piece there. And, um, and, and the good news is anyway, um, we both made it. Um, I, in that moment, I said to my husband, um, who was in the birthing suite, I think I'm having a near death experience and one of us might not make it and it's going to be okay. Cause I knew it was going to be okay. Uh, maybe not for them, but that was my knowing in the moment. The good news is, um, it was all okay, you know, me and baby girl. And I also had the the 
kind of yes okay we go and do the the cesarean we do the emergency cesarean and within one hour it all happens very quick after you say yes to, to an intervention like that after 90 hours then it was just one hour from that and I was holding my baby girl at 3 33 p.m you know and as traumatic as it could have been it was, and I, I meet mamas all the time who have had these highly disempowering hospital experiences and, you know, feel like a whole heap of things are being ripped away from them. And then there's the stress and the post-traumatic stuff that happens afterwards and the grief. I actually felt highly empowered after that because, because of that spiritual experience. And this is the magic. This is why I love working with people through these experiences so much because, you know, and you'd know this, Peggy, a lot of folks in the spiritual community think you just sit on a cushion, meditate, and it's all love, light, and bliss, and, and it's far from it, right? It's so far from it. You, you could have these highly traumatic, ugly, messy situations, but in the midst of that, have something that is so incredibly exquisite, and because of it, it can be the powerful, transformative piece that just helps give a bigger understanding of think things are not quite what they seem to be <laughs> my first yeah. c-section i just turned 19. oh it was traumatic whoa. yeah i did not want a c-section at all and then i don't know about you but at the time so that was 1980 um so i was pregnant again in nine months and they said once a c-section always one and so they said i can only have two kids and I wanted like 10 kids, you know, and so that dramatically changed my life, having to have that first C-section. And then later doctors said, oh, no, I would have let you have natural. And, and but, you know, then I know women's had five C-sections. It's just what doctor you get, wow. what they tell you. And then um, one of my daughter-in-laws, her second birth, um, they said that she had a first one C-section. And she actually started to rupture. And it was a good thing they went to the hospital when they did, because she could have bled out, could have ruptured. And that's why they told me I couldn't have any more than two, because they said it could rupture. And I thought, yeah, I don't know anybody right. that that happened, but then she was, she was one of could have. So. And, you know, interestingly, so the day after the delivery of, of my baby had happened, um, the woman who had done the, the, the line, the cut, came she'd been um visiting actually and, and teaching some of the others there so I had a, a really high level doctor which was wonderful and she actually came in just to check in on me see see how I was going and she said Nicole had we not pulled out the baby when we did um then we would have been reviving her on the table so you know I was I was grateful um that that was the right decision to make and yeah yeah I and, and it made me grateful for modern medicine truly grateful yeah yeah even though I'd, I'd been so I must do this naturally and of course I reclaimed that part with the second birth I ended up birthing the second one naturally because I just for, my, oh, yeah. for myself I had to I had to reclaim that you know <laughs> yeah. um, and that was beautiful that was a completely different type of experience um, yeah yeah mm -hmm. birthing That's what it. a journey for mamas <laughs> yeah. yeah with my uh, twins I was 25 I had the NDE of the tubal pregnancy and people ask me later like why didn't I sue that doctor because I called him for a week and said something's wrong you know the pain was getting worse and worse every day he says Peggy it's not a tool pregnancy and even I went to the hospital and all that pain and it, it faded right before I left though or right before I got there and he still said it's not a tool pregnancy I said well I'm not going home because you know I'm gonna I didn't want my sons to find me dead I knew I was dying because I just had an NDE of course I couldn't tell him but you know like people said why didn't you sue him I was like how do you sue a doctor that saved your life because he did come in early the next morning because I prayed because I kept, you know, I knew I kept dying during the night. You know, I didn't have any more NDEs. And I just prayed to God during the night because, you know, I was at the hospital that, that my doctor would come in early. Just keep me alive long enough that my doctor come in early. He'll, you know, maybe do an ultrasound and find out what's going on because he says it's not tubal. So what is it? Well, it was the biggest tubal they ever saw. But with the, one of the twins was in the uterus and the other was in the tube. And it was half in and half out. And it looked like they were both in. And that was the problem. So, but yeah, I was like, well, you know, he saved my life. And also too, when you get your life back, because I was told it was my time, you know, the answer was no, I couldn't come back. And then I was like, how can you be mad at anybody? Right. You know, I, <laughs> right. I, I should not, my, there should be a funeral for me. I mean, they called my whole family and said, she's not going to make it. 
And that my sister wow. said, my mom was mad that she would be left making the funeral arrangements because she knew my husband would be too upset, wouldn't be able to. And all, and all this stuff was going on that I found out later. But like, I can't. And I still see that doctor to this day, like 30 some years later, I still see. Him. It wasn't, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was just, it was a mistake. He said, at my six week checkup, he said, you taught me to listen to my patients over my machines. So I thought, well, maybe another baby's life will be saved because he'll listen to his patients now because he was not listening right. at all. He is, why do you keep saying such a pregnancy? <laughs> I don't know, I'm stupid, I guess, but I'm not going home. And it was. Mm. So. Beautiful. What a gift for him too, then. Yeah. I'm curious, what's that um, transpersonal psychology? What is that mm-hmm. like? What's that um, education like? Oh, it was great. I loved it. I felt like I was home um, in terms of academia. You know, I've, I've always been a learning geek. I, I love books. Um, I love, I've, I've always wanted to learn. Um, and so when I came across the word transpersonal, I'm like, oh, this is me. Like, th- this is the thing. Because I've, I've had a real love-hate relationship with the word spiritual um, because it's such a loaded term, right? And it can be a real turnoff for some people. And yet at the same time, many people can identify themselves by that term, like, oh, I, I gravitate to it. But it, it also comes loaded because in, in, you know, there are those who would consider it a bit wacky or woo-woo. Or, and, and I knew that that wasn't the case, having had many spiritual experiences. So when I came across the term transpersonal, which actually means, so trans and personal, it's, it's, the the energy or the greater thing that moves through you and beyond you so it's you know which essentially is like creator life force energy whatever term you want to put to that right it is how we as a physical being are moved um through life yeah and beyond um so it's 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 a beautiful field of study and learning and it's still very young Um, as well there's not many places in the world California is the home of transpersonal psychology and um, I I just wish that conventional psychology would clue into it you know more Um, but there's certainly you know positive psychology is kind of moving a bit there but it's not it's not there completely because positive psychology comes from a different school of thought but there's so much gold to be had in the transpersonal realm. Um, it's just that the way that our current system is still sees a bit of what it can't understand of the human mind as a little bit scary. And so it's, it's a bit out there. Um, so our, our current system of psychology is not yet ready. Um, to go there and it's unfortunate because people are because people are having these experiences so when people bump up against the system the system's like I either don't understand you or something's wrong with you or you should go to your religious pathway whatever that is right because I don't quite know so it's a real Russian roulette in terms of who you encounter in that moment people can have this full-blown spiritual experience And if they're not around a community that can have that conversation or if they don't even know that there are people to talk about that with or there is language for it, they've just had this experience, naturally they're going to look to where they can find some answers to tell them they're not crazy, right? That's the first step. They need some affirmation that I am not nuts because they know inside that they're not nuts, right? It's like, okay, I, if I know if I talk about this, someone's going to think I'm nuts, but that was like the most real or significant or beautiful or powerful thing I've ever had, right? So surely I can't be nuts for having that because it seems so real and it is real. Um, so we, we've got a long way to go, a long way to go between the bridge of supporting people through their authentic, direct experiences and, you know, holding space in wholesome ways. Um, holding space in grounded ways, in truly open, non-judgmental ways and helping people. That's one step. And then the next is actually helping people celebrate and take the wisdom of those experiences so that they can walk their path, so that they can bring the gifts and the wisdom of that to the rest of us on the planet and 
live from that place because as far as I'm concerned that's where the real magic happens that's where the real purpose happens is when we can be activated by these things make decisions from that place be in our most authentic resonant zone life is just better you know from that place we're more energized we have better relationships we give of ourselves better we're a better quality person to be around you know and um we're better mamas we're better partners we're better colleagues whatever what, however it is that you encounter others it can just when you can live from that space and the wisdom of your own experiences I, I feel that's the ground that we can truly help one another and live in more soulful healthful ways and just heal a lot of the nonsense and rubbish that is on the planet where we harm each other and we harm our home our planet home yeah Yeah. i turn on the news and it's like it's all negative it's awful with you know uh, i don't even i don't like watch it very much anymore because it's just criticizing that's how it is nobody's doing anything changing anything just criticizing i don't want to hear all this criticism (laughs) no if you're gonna do something do something let's see what you're gonna do but (laughs) otherwise that's right that's right it's easy it's easy to complain it's really easy to complain and point the finger and blame Uh, but get up off your bum and do something pick one thing pick one thing that you're so unhappy with and you're so uncomfortable about and just make a change in that area start small you know yeah i just never had a lot of patience for just just whining like i used to have this friend and she called me every day and whine for hours I'm like, I can't do this with you. I really, I'm sorry, I can't, you know. I, I, I've got to be active. I've got to be doing things. Like if you got a big problem, I'll sit there with you. I'll come to your house and hold your hand. But this constant crying, I can't take it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's yeah, just, get proactive like, it's about it. do. <laughs> well, and, and this is where, you know, this is where that aha came about the being a co-creator you know, that, okay, so something is unpleasant in my experience. There's something going on that I don't like, you know, so much. Okay, fine. What can I do about that? There are many things that I could do. I could sit and moan. I could ring up people and cry about it all day. Does that help them? Probably not. (laughs) You know, does that aid my friendship? Probably not. What else could I do then? You know, that is actually a bit more empowering, um, so that I can step into more of my being, right, and use that wisdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, I'm curious uh, now. I'm going to go off topic, but so do you study in that field? Do you study near death experiences and after death and all those kind of things we talk about, or is it like psych, more of psychology, actual subjects, or? Yeah, well, it's. Um, Well, I can't even remember when I came across the term near death experience and whether it was in within that course. I know that I I started getting familiar with the near death community um, when I was, you know, doing my studies. Um, Yeah. Did we study? Was there a topic on near death experiences? No. Was there a subject on that? No. But there was one subject that really when the penny dropped for me and it was this blessed professor, his name is Ryan Rominger. He later became the chair of my of my dissertation because I just I, I adored this man. And um, he ran a class called Exceptional Human Experiences, EHEs. Um, and so I was like, that sounds cool. And we talked about that. And so EHEs are actually a category. Um, it was so doctors Raya White and Suzanne Brown back in the 70s, I think. Um, so Dr. B- uh, White, Raya White, was in the field of paranormal studies and, uh, and research. And she just found it quite kind of um, mechanical and it wasn't quite tapping into the more marvellous and miraculous pieces of it. So she felt there was a bit more. So she went from the very scientific way of doing paranormal research into looking at something more and she ended up coining this phrase an exceptional human experience an ehe and those two doctors suzanne brown and raya white together 
um, collected hundreds of stories of people who had had this thing called an exceptional human experience. And as a result of that, they categorized, um, they, they collected over 500 different types of experiences. Wow. And when I say types, we're talking like, you know, near death experience, out of body experience, so and the you know, kind types. of full on wow. things over 500 types through to, I guess, your more garden variety experiences of um, dreams and falling in love. And these are all, they, they can be exceptional human experiences, not ordinary dreams, but, you know, some of those dreams that are really like, you know, they're either lucid or maybe yeah. they're transformational in some way. So over 500 types. And this is where it's like, there is so much stuff going on out there in terms of people and their experiences that is exceptional. And they include things in there like peak experience as well. So anyway, this massive umbrella of over 500 different types. And from that, they made this category of 10, 10 different types. You can see all of this in my book, The Power of Notes. And I'll give you the link, Peggy, and people can download the book for free because I've this came through my research as well. And I had to condense all of this down, but I wanted a, a reader-friendly version for people. Um, because it was very helpful for me. And so these 10 categories, that, and so there are death experiences that fit within those 10 categories, and that's where a near-death experience, shared death experience, all of those things, near-death-like experience, they would all fit in with that category. Um, and, yeah, so they went ahead, they did this research, they collected the stories, they then figured out ways to help people get their story out as well. Um, and so that was the subject when, you know, Dr. Ryan Rominger was teaching us and we were sitting in this nice little group and we're talking about these exceptional human experiences. This, I just had such a strong, like, this is my world. I, I understand everything about this conversation. Everything coming out of your mouth makes sense to me and I love it. And how do I get more and more, you know? So um EHEs were really a powerful way for me to understand how big all of this is um and so that was one of the subjects for example within the study of transpersonal psychology um there are others like you know using creative art as modes of expression or using your body and um yeah different faith paths and what is the wisdom from those as well so loads of things loads of things yeah because there's nothing at it, your it, average it, university that you can go and learn about any of this stuff. And you won't find transpersonal psychology at your average university either. So um, there are a few institutions in California um, that go along these lines. So I started off at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, which is now Sophia University, but things have changed there. I'm not sure how, how transpersonal that is anymore. Um, I shifted over then to the California Institute of Integral Studies, CIIS, um, and there they have many programs that can be considered transpersonal, and I completed my PhD in transpersonal and integral psychology there. Um, and what else? There are others. There are, I think, Naropa University. So there are, there are some in that hub um, area that get it. Um, certainly at that level of, of academics. Um, but you don't have to go through and do a great course of study in it. I mean, when you have a lived experience, that that is, you know, the lived experience, that's the direct experience. And there's already so many books out there and, you know, wonderful resources. Um, if, if people are new to this, you know, you can just Google transpersonal psychology and, you know, you'll come across fabulous people like this, the Groffs, you know, Stanislav Groff, Stanislav and Christina Groff. And um, they termed um, the coin, I think, spiritual emergency, you know. So there's been great books that have been out from probably about maybe the 70s, the 80s, you know, Ram Dass and his stuff that would fit into this idea of transpersonal psychology as well. Um, so really it, it, it can accompany, it, it can hold space for many types of people and many types of experiences and help validate and say, you're not nuts. You're going through something profound and significant that we humans have done for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years and there are ancient practices and there are ancient cultures who understood this and knew how to work with it and you know maybe there would be shamans in a community that would actually identify someone and say oh you have particular gifts and this is what you're going to do uh, within the community because these are your gifts and you know so yeah we have a long way to come 
in, in the modern world. But the good thing is if you know where to look and you start diving down that road, you can shift out of this idea of I've had something where my brain is broken or I've had some kind of a pathological, you know, thing go on or it's all in my imagination. You can shift out of that thinking to finding a whole body of knowledge that says, no, no, this is powerful and profound and get to understand your experiences because they're your doorways, you know, to more of you and a better life and true service and, and all of those fabulous things. Now, where do your clients come from? Like, do, uh, you know, like a psychiatrist, we know where who refers patients to them, but like for you, how would they know? to refer a patient to you? Yeah, so, well, eventually when people are having things happen <laughs> that they can't explain any other way and there's some spiritual aspects to okay. it, you know, the soul is not at ease in terms of all the explanations they've got, then people will, you know, find me um, somehow, you know. And um, it's it, it, I, I look at it like this in terms of transpersonal psychology. When your body, when you have a broken bone, you go to a doctor who can help fix your physical body or you go to the hospital. When your heart is broken or, you know, this so-called idea that my mind might be broken, right, in, in the modern world, which many people talk about, but really, you know, I'm depressed or I'm anxious or I have these issues going on, I'm having troubles in my this space, we go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist for kind of mind issues and sometimes heart issues. But where do you go when your soul, where do you go when your soul is restless? When it's, um, you know, when you have existential things like, I don't know if I want to be on this planet anymore, right? Um, and not that I hate being here, I still want to be here, but there are things that, you know, it's too painful or I've had these spiritual experiences that tell me somewhere else is a much better place to be than here. Yeah, in the place. years of homesick. How do I... Right, right. They're homesick. That's that's for the NDE community. And and this can happen, you know, for people who've had these spiritual experiences. It's like, how do I get back to that? That was amazing. That was beautiful. Or that was just truly awesome. Um, and this earth experience just seems really bland and I can't find meaning or purpose in it. So these are the types of conversations that someone like me will have because it's like, okay, how do we understand the content and the experiences that you've had to make the earth experience meaningful, you know, wonderful, profound. Um, so actually a lot of the stuff that I do is not so much about the spiritual experiences themselves. That's the early piece of the conversation. It's actually really grounded, practical stuff like how are your relationships? How are your finances? How is your home and the space that you live in? How do you feel within your, your physical body? Like getting really grounded into like just being on planet earth with the wisdom of the experiences and that's the missing link right so bringing all of the goodness from those experiences in to help inform the earth trod and i think when we can do that life life is just it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination because you can also become much more empathic and eyes wide open to all of the pain and the hurt and the suffering and the BS that's going on in the world. So it's not like you're going to dig your head in the spiritual sand and be happy and, and blissed out for the rest of your life. That's not it. But you're going to be a powerful agent of understanding the greatest qualities of what this human experience can be about and how can we collectively create more of that action that and do that and once people are clicked on to their own capacity to do that that becomes a really powerful place to parent from to be a lover from to lead from the, the book that i wrote that i'll share the link with you know it's the power of notes these non-ordinary transcendent experiences like the ehes how they transform the way we live love and lead because that is what they do we just elevate into a new um it's like our regular person but a new version of it right or a more enhanced improved version we can do us it's still us it's still us at our core but we can do us better um yeah 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 i kind of like the notice and like where i find my happy space and to do more of that and make sure that i set a time to do that. You know, I don't have to set time now. I'm doing this stuff all the time. But if 
like when I have to go work with my husband, say on the pipeline, and I'm just so away from myself is what it feels like. You know, I have to do, I have to care about pipe and, and these bolts and, you know, these things I hate. And then, but I just can't wait till get home, dinner, shower, and then I can watch my near death experience and stuff and my near death experience movies and, you know, those kind of things that I just have that to look forward. But the guys are going to drink, not my husband, but yeah, as long as just going to go drink or whatever. And it's like, you go do that because I know where my happiest place is. So I just had to start right. making time for me, which was my spiritual stuff. I just, it's like um, a, a drug. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, it's so important that we know how to tap into that happy place um, that we have. And also as we live from that place and start to infuse it out, how can we spread more of that happy stuff so that the less pleasant things that we have to do that we might not want to do, we can actually start to bring more aspects of joy to it, you know? Um, like I know very few people who enjoy doing their taxes and I'm not saying you have to start loving doing your taxes. Right. But there are there are different approaches instead of banging your head on the door about it or even having outbursts at other people about it or you know things like that when we when there are certain things that we don't want to do or we're avoiding how can we be a bit more adult about it and put our big shoes on and just get the job done efficiently and effectively without you know all of the all of the other pieces um and then if there are aspects of our life that we truly want to change to then also have the courage to start to do that as well and go, you know, I really, I don't enjoy doing these things. Like, what am I going to do about that? You know, can I change my attitude to how I am in that moment? If I can't change what I have to do, like I have to do this action. I can't get out of it. There's no other way I'll ever be able to stop doing it. Okay. So how can I change my attitude to the situation so that I'm not disempowered in the moment? How can I bring the best of me to this moment? Or can I actually change that thing um, that I'm doing? Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise we shrivel and die, you know, otherwise we just, you know, we get so small on the inside and we lose our life energy. And of course, then life has no meaning or richness or juice to it, you know, no substance. Um, and that's not a way to live. We don't have to live like that. I know many people are, many people are just barely hanging on by a thread, just just surviving forget thriving so many people who are just surviving in a world that is so unhealthy you know this modern world is not built anywhere near natural cycles or you know ways of ways that are more better suited to who we are so it's understandable that when all of these red flags are coming up in your life in terms of my body's sick in this way or um, this relationship is in trouble or, you know, stressors in your life and the red flags, these are helpful indicators, not things that we have to suppress, which again, modern medicine and psychology teach us to do often is just put a Band-Aid on it, treat the symptoms, forget the root cause. No, 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 no. For the soul, we have to go to the root cause. We must right? And, but we also have to create the space and the safety to do that. And so that's part of the work too, um, is even getting, even acknowledging that that's what's going on and then creating the space um, for it and the safe environment and whether that means sharing with another person or even writing your thoughts down in a book or just processing them and moving through us in some way. But if we keep throwing band-aids on top of things, mm -hmm. what happens in a natural environment, it will fester eventually at the core. And, and, and that is just not a good place to be living from, um, nor do we have to. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes it comes down to being honest with yourself, you know, that you might be doing things you hate and you're denying that you hate them that much and you're denying and you're just doing it, doing it and you're not really stopping and, and looking at yourself in the mirror and it's like, what are you doing? Is this what you want to be doing? And how can you do something else if, if this isn't working? You know, there's honest conversations with ourselves that you know, I was talking to somebody a while ago and, and they're so highly intelligent. They could be doing anything and they're in this low paying job just because of this and that. And they don't want to take these risks. And it's like, you got to step out of that. Stop the past. All I hear is you talking about the past, the past, the past. I don't hear you say anything about the future. That anything that you're thinking about accomplishing or doing, because you, I mean, I, I would love to have their intelligence. So, man, if I had your intelligence, I would have so many degrees. 
you know, I wouldn't be settling for this. Why are you settling? Because I had to work really hard in college. I mean, because I was not smart in school because I didn't pay any attention. So I had to work really, really hard. And, and somebody that just, everything comes so easy and you're not, you know, living to your potential. And I don't know if they'll listen to me or not, but, <laughs> but is there anything you're else? You're 100% right. It's the honesty. Yeah. 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 Is there anything else we didn't get to cover that you'd like to add or? Oh, I think we've covered so much ground, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> I get everybody else so talking and they forget what they're even going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's marvelous. And this is the richness of the conversation. And, and I love that it flows where it needed to flow today. You know, that's that's beautiful. And thank you for sharing a bit of your experiences too. It's nice for me to know some of that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. And um, it's been informative. <laughs> And it's, it's always nice to Thank talk you to so much another for me. child drowning in the year. Yes, yes, yes. We, they're, they're incredible experiences. So I'm glad we made it through. I'm <laughs> and so thanks upset for you didn't have pain though. <laughs> like, how come I had all that pain? <laughs> I'm happy you didn't, of course. But it's just like, <laughs> gosh, I can remember that pain. <laughs> But then, you know, I've heard that before of people drowning and, and they didn't have that pain. They just, they were into their experience just like that. So. I was probably fighting it and just didn't go to the light. <laughs> you know, and I didn't have that having experience either. Mine was all our body thing, but it sounds like you had some help there. So maybe some. And, and this is what I find, you know this is what I find so incredible about hearing people's stories because everyone is just so unique yeah. you know there are common themes and threads but each story just has its own pieces um that are like divinely orchestrated for that person and exactly what needs to happen for them to understand it's it's incredible and it yeah. irritates me when I hear people in the audience say well, that doesn't ring true because that doesn't sound like everybody else's story. And I said, I'm not so sure I would believe a story that sounded like everybody else's story. So, but yeah, they're unique. So thank you so much. It's nice seeing you thank again. Thank you, Peggy. Good luck and to you. And you. <laughs> thank Bye. you.